Hey, what's up? It's Triggy, and today we're going to be building a motor controller. If you're working with a microcontroller like a Raspberry Pi, you're going to want to connect its pins to other ICs and components. You can do that any old way with wiring, but then it starts to get really messy, and it's a lot more convenient if we can use a shield. A shield is a circuit board that attaches directly onto the pins of the microcontroller, which consolidates all of that wiring. Then we have access to all the functionality of whatever the board happens to do. So let's talk quickly about how an H-Bridge motor controller actually works. Obviously we're trying to control the behavior of a motor, so we have one on screen here. If we hook it up with the positive terminal to some voltage, let's say 12, and the negative to ground, we'll get the motor to spin. And if we were to switch them the other way, then the motor would just rotate in the other direction. So if we can get it to do both those things at our command, then we're doing okay. That's kind of the idea of the H-Bridge. In an H-Bridge motor controller, we'll set it up like this with four transistors in the positions that you see here. Transistors for our purposes are just going to act as switches that you can control with electronic signals. So for example, if we were to send a 5 volt signal to these two transistors, you see that we have that first arrangement and the motor will rotate in one direction. Now if we were to activate the other two transistors instead, it would rotate in the other direction. To round out the design, we'll add a couple diodes that'll protect against any high back EMF voltages. And lastly, we'll tie all the transistor gate inputs to ground so that they default to off, even if there's no signal. We can put together a schematic using a website like EasyEDA, where we can select our components and attach them with wires like this. I went ahead and made four of those H-Bridge motor controllers, as described earlier, and then have them connect to a Raspberry Pi. Now we can just go ahead and convert this schematic to a PCB, and we can start designing it, laying it out, and setting the traces to connect all the correct terminals. Once we're happy with our design, we can download the Gerber files and immediately purchase them from JLC PCB. So a box just arrived from JLC PCB, let's open it up. Inside we find the PCBs as promised, both sides looking spectacular. And it looks like they also sent us a little keychain, how cute is that? Obviously I'm not sponsored by JLC PCB, but I sure would love to be, so if somebody knows somebody. Let's take a closer look. We see we have some nice thick traces where we're going to have some higher amperage moving through, which is actually going to power the motors. Here we have a smaller but sufficiently thick trace that's going to power the Raspberry Pi. And then these thin ones are just going to be signal pins. They don't carry any substantial current, so we don't have to worry about those being very thick at all. Along with the PCBs, I ordered all the components that we're going to use to populate them. The first one here is a power transistor. That's just a transistor that can handle a pretty good amount of current. This one here is the IRF630, and if we take a look at the data sheet, we see that it can handle voltages and currents way higher than what we're going to need, so that's great. Can you tell I've been watching a lot of Great Scott? The next component is the screw terminal block. It just allows you to attach wires onto the PCB. This is done by unscrewing one of the terminals, inserting the wire, and then screwing it back in to clamp that wire into place. Next we have the diodes. These are pretty straightforward, they just only allow current to flow in one direction. They're small enough that it's pretty hard for the camera to focus on, so here I've tricked the camera by placing a number of other small objects. You can see on one side of the diode there's that gray line that indicates in which direction the current can flow. Then we're going to need this 20 by 2 set of header pins so that we can pop our shield right onto the Raspberry Pi's pins. Let's get to work soldering. I'll start with the transistors. Now let's solder on these terminal blocks. Oh no, we forgot the diodes! That's okay, we'll solder those on too. Now that we have the diodes in place, the last thing we need to solder are these header pins. And we're just about ready to go here. We have all of our transistors, diodes, terminal blocks, and header pins soldered on. The transistors are probably a little big for what we need here, but I'd rather be safe than sorry and they weren't that expensive, all things considered. And with that, we are ready to test it out. But before we do that, we have to write a Python library. So I'm just going to look at our schematic and see what the Raspberry Pi pin number is and what the transistor number is and make sure that those are set equal. So now that I have all those assigned, we can start grouping them into groups of transistors that are going to act together. So for example, our first motor is going to consist of the first four transistor pins. If we want to move it forward, we'll activate the first and fourth. If we want to move it backwards, we'll move the second and third. And if we want to have it break, we'll move the second and fourth. Oh, I forgot, we also want to set up all these pins as digital output pins. And we'll just write some functions to set lists of pins, high or low. 
Now we'll write the behavior for each motor, setting the correct transistors on or off according to whether or not we want each motor to be going forward, backward, or braking. And that's all of our setup, so now we'll write a script that'll test out each of the motors going forward and backwards. I didn't want to have to power the Raspberry Pi separately from the motors, so I just used this BEC battery elimination circuit to do a 12 volt to 5 volt conversion. So yeah, this is actually supposed to be the first test, but you can see nothing is happening, and that's because I realized I totally forgot to include the pull down resistors in our schematic. So I'll just go ahead and add those on by hand now. Now let's run this test again. I'm going to test each motor output one at a time. So right now we'll start with that first motor port and then test it in both directions. Now we can move on to two. That one's looking good as well. Now we'll test out that third port. And finally port four. So it looks like all of our ports are working, which is super exciting, because that means we got this thing to work. There's just one caveat. I happen to know the output of this motor is actually substantially higher than what we just saw, and I realize now that's because the on voltage for our transistor is actually 10 volts, and we've been supplying 5. And we can see with 5 volts, we're not getting enough current flow. So if I were to do this again, I would of course use a different transistor. I don't know if I'm going to redo that whole thing, though I don't think I'm going to redo it in this video. We'll call it there. That's it for this video. Thanks so much for watching. If you like this kind of content, be sure to subscribe. In any case, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll see you next time.